Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Almost five decades ago, in 1961, Alan Shepard piloted Freedom, the Freedom 7 mission. He was the first American to travel into space on a suborbital flight. Since then, many men and women have journeyed into space, advancing our understanding of the universe. This great adventure has required hardware, launch vehicles, spacecraft, and for the astronauts themselves, very specialized garments. The museum's collection, which includes almost 300 spacesuits, related parts and components, is the largest in the world. It includes prototypes and flown suits associated with some of the most famous names in the space exploration, such as John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, and Jim Lovell. Preserving America's spacesuits is a special privilege afforded the Smithsonian Institution. We received a Save America's Treasures grant from the White House in 1999. The project allowed us to conduct pioneering work on the suits themselves and to develop state-of-the-art storage criteria. We work with other museums, many of which house spacesuits on loan from the Smithsonian, to develop specialized care required for spacesuits. We've worked with the conservators around the world. In 2009, we published Spacesuits, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum collection, which provides an amazing overview of these artifacts. It was compiled by Amanda Young, who is on the panel this evening. The spectacular photographs were taken by Smithsonian photographer Mark Avino, who is in the audience tonight. Mark, would you stand up and be recognized? Here he is. Right here. Our colleagues at the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service, or SITES, saw the book and realized the potential for an exhibition. This collaborative e exhibit, Suited for Space, in is in production and will soon be launched. As a SITES exhibition, it will be viewed in communities beyond Washington. SITES is the largest traveling exhibition service in the world, and for 56 years has been the institution's main exhibits ambassador. Its director is Ms. Anna Cohn. Anna, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> okay. Just in time, eh? The <laughs> suited for space, uh, suited for space, both the exhibition and tonight's program could not have been possible without the generous support of DuPont. Representing DuPont is Mr. Mark Vergnano. Mark, would you stand? Here we go. Okay. For those of you who attend our programs, you know that these would not be possible without this sponsorship. So we're really indebted to you for the uh, for your vision and seeing the value of, uh, of sponsoring this program tonight. We're delighted to have you here, and thank you very much. The um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Kathleen Lewis, curator of space history and moderator for tonight's program. Dr. Lewis. Thank you, General Daly, and welcome to you all. As um, General Daly said, my name is Kathleen Lewis, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the Air and Space Museum's uh, program this evening and the kickoff event for the opening of SITE's new exhibit, Suited for Space. Tonight's topic is the science of the spacesuit. The name of the spacesuit is a bit of a misnomer. Although astronauts wear suits when they work, they're neither business attire nor they're merely decorative. Spacesuits are, by definition, tightly fitting personal spacecraft that carry all that is necessary for life and protect astronauts from the harsh conditions beyond our atmosphere. Before the space age, pilots, balloonists, and engineers had worked for decades to create a suit that will protect life at high altitudes. When nations first began to send humans into space 50 years ago, engineers adapted these high altitude flight suits to serve as temporary lifeboats for this new breed of explorer. Flight suits were retrofitted with life support systems and connections to the spacecraft. But it was President Kennedy's challenge of the Apollo program in 1961 that brought about changes to this approach to spacesuits. 
For Apollo, a suit would no longer be a backup or a precautionary system, but would be the only source of life support for, as men first explored the moon. The Apollo spacesuits are true artifacts of the Apollo program in that they exhibit the engineering, innovation, adaptations of the materials, science, and technology that were required to send men to the moon. As they are unique um, in their personalized way in which they had to be manufactured in order to do their jobs. NASA, as we mentioned before, has the world's largest collection of spacesuits, including nearly 300 flight and pressure suits and their ancillary components. Most of these suits came to the museum through our agreement with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to preserve and exhibit hardware from their programs once they were finished with them. At the time of our heaviest period of collecting in the rush to collect, to complete the Apollo program and the rush to collect and display, we retained little information on how the suits were created. It was only in the end of the last century when we had time to pause and reflect that my colleague, Amanda Young, took the initiative to apply for a grant to investigate the proper methods to store, preserve, and display the suits. Over the course of four years, she documented, collated multiple records, and recruited a legion of experts, some of whom I know are here in the audience tonight. Um, one of the many byproducts of her work on, on the spacesuit is her book, Spacesuits, and you'll all have an opportunity to purchase this and have her and um, Mark Avino autograph it tonight after our program. The book published the photographs um, that our staff provider, Mark, uh, photographer Mark Avino, who's already been introduced, took, Amanda's reflections on the narrative that our suits tell, and even includes the pioneering x-rays, like the one behind me, that our colleague Ronald Cunningham made of the suits at the Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute. When sites saw Amanda and Mark's books, they immediately understand the understood the values of creating a traveling show, which would highlight the work that these two have done. The exhibition will offer close-up views of the NASA suits that even the visitors to our museum here on the mall could not see. Full-scale photographic prints and x-ray images of our collection, ranging from pre-NASA spacesuits through the Apollo and including experimental and prototype suits that are not very frequently seen by our public, along with small examples of three-dimensional objects from our national collection. The exhibit will open first on March 19, 2011 at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, running there through September of that year, and from there it will go to museums throughout the country. Tonight we have a wonderful opportunity to hear the opinion of experts in their respective fields on the science and technology of spacesuits. Tonight I expect that we will all expand our understanding of the materials, construction, testing, use, and preservation and conservation of the spacesuits. I would like to introduce the panelists for tonight, and if they would kindly take their um, places on the, at the table as I introduce them. Um, first of all, um, Vladik Gabara is a chemist and a DuPont for, fellow. He's worked for DuPont for 40 years and has made pioneering innovations in the creation and development of DuPont Kevlar and Nomex fibers. Born in Bielostok, Poland, Dr. Gabara began work in the United States in, in the Orlan Acrylics fab, Fibers Division of DuPont, and he continues to work on applica the applications and development of advanced fibers in Richmond. Joseph Cosmo, blinded by the light, um, is a senior project engineer in the EVA and spacesuit systems branch of the crew and thermal systems division, engineering directorate at the Johnson Space Center of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I'm amazed that you can fit that on a business card, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could. <laughs> he started with the original NASA Langley Space Task Group on November 21st, 1961 a few short months after Kennedy's declaration that we were going to go to the moon by the end of the decade, and has been at NASA for 49 years, and has participated in the, the design, development, and testing of all major spacesuit assemblies, including Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, 
Apollo-Soyuz test project, shuttle, and the International Space Station program-related suit systems. Dr. Joseph Kerwin is a re retired captain in the Naval Medical Corps and was selected as a scientist astronaut by NASA in June 1965. Dr. Curran served as a science pilot for the Skylab 2 mission, which launched on May 25th and lasted to June 22nd, 1973. Along with his colleagues, Charles Conrad and Paul Weitz, he, who accompanied him for his initial, the initial activation of the 28-day flight qualifications operation of the Skylab orbital workshop. Dr. Kerwin subsequently was in charge of the on-orbit branch of the astronaut office, where he coordinated astronaut activity involving rendezvous, satellite development and retrieval, and other shovel payload operations. And what that translates into short, very briefly, is EVA activity, spacewalking, handling, wearing suits and handling objects in space. Since his retirement from NASA in 1987, Dr. Kerwin has worked for Lockheed System, um, systems Research Laboratories, and the Life Sciences Special Business Unit of Weill Laboratories. Dr. Kerwin also serves on the Board of Directors of the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. And last but not least, Amanda Young, um, who has been mentioned many times before, um, is a recently retired museum specialist in space suits at the National Air and Space Museum. During her tenure at NASA, NASA, she supervised the museum's contribution to the American Festival Japan exhibit in 1994, was collections manager for the space history um, collections of space artifacts. Um, she solicited and won the Save America's Treasures grant from the White House in 1999 and a subsequent matching grant um, from Hamilton Sunstrand, which inaugurated a four-year project of documenting, conserving, and preserving the NASA's collections of spacesuits. Tonight we will be begin with individual presentations from each of our panelists on their personal perspectives on spacesuits, and then we'll turn into a discussion of what we know and how we understand these magnificent material objects. That must be me. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gabara is. <laughs> I, um, I heard something from uh, Kathy uh, that is, uh, there is a chemistry test tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> for, those, for those who did not recognize from your high school chemistry, the formula is nylon 66, and uh, Wallace Carruthers on the right is the one who said the foundations for synthetic fibers. Uh, I, first, I wanted to, to really thank for the opportunity to, to be in this panel. That's really a, a great honor. Uh, if, if you don't hear me, just let me know. Uh, 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 the last time I did uh, uh, singing, was uh, most probably 60, <laughs> 60 years ago. Uh, I, I wanted to thank Smithsonian uh, and uh, DuPont for sponsoring that exhibit. Uh, I, in my view, the <coughs> exhibits of this type serve two fundamental purposes. One is to celebrate those who contributed to that invention. The second one is to educate us to educate us about what is that we did and possibly how come we did that. Uh, the last one is very important because that is a promise for the future. So I will try to touch briefly on, on these three things. Uh, let me start with uh, celebration. Uh, I, I've never been introduced in such a highfalutin words as today and that should not be that's a misnomer, all of that. Uh, it's the hundreds of scientists of Japan who were responsible for this wonderful product that we are going to talk about today. Uh, I'm just a small component of the same one. So let's celebrate those who, who did this work over many, many years and quite clearly 
as we continue through the design and uh, use and uh, preservation of suits, we have a whole group of people to celebrate. Very quickly, we'll end up with uh, the society at large. So that's the first part. Uh, let me maybe have a next slide, and I will try to talk about what is that they did, or what is maybe what we did. This is a, a listing of materials in the 21, <laughs> 21 layers of the suit. And uh, I, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, uh, it's interesting. I like the fact that that's an old copy. That that's really the copy of what the oldest copy I could get on on this subject. But you'll notice that uh, a lot of the materials which are listed there are the materials which were not developed for the space suit itself. Uh, uh, if I could get the next slide, uh, uh, which lists the materials in, a, in a, uh, a little bit clearer way, you'll find that a lot of these materials were developed for other, and I will call it here cutely, earthly reasons. Uh, neoprene, uh, 1930, uh, long before we even dreamed about coming to, to space. Uh, Nylon, I already <coughs> referred to Carothers, 1938. Teflon, 1938. Polyester fiber, which is an important component of uh, 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 the suit itself. It's uh, mid, it's early 40s. Then we continue to films. By the way, that uh, one thing which I, I think you'll find interesting, fibers are known to exist in, in nature, uh, wool cotton. Nature did not produce films. We did that. <laughs> so uh, mylar film, spandex, uh, elastin, elastin fiber, uh, finally captain film, Nomex, and beta cloth. I, I am with DuPont. So you could say I'm uh, uh, trying to uh, out stress DuPont as an inventor of all of these products. But in reality, I think it's a fascinating issue to find out, to at least examine how come that happened this way. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, these are the materials which Joe selected. Uh, I, I did not know Joe at the time. Uh, so I will try maybe very briefly to, to address why in the last slide of my uh, too long earlier remarks. Could I have? Whoa. Uh, I, the role of accidental discoveries dramatically overstated. We like uh, 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 stories of accidents which led to discovery. In reality, science is not done this way by mixing un random things together and see what's going to happen. It's done by examining seriously things that we do know. Now, luckily, we do not know everything, so we have unexpected results. Being open to these unexpected results underlies the invention which we are after. All of the things that we talk through are partially a result of that, of that process. So that, that would say to me that fundamental science is a critical component of all of these innovations. Uh, DuPont brought a, a chemist from Harvard uh, Wallace Carothers to, to DuPont and offered him reasonably free hand of working on polymer chemistry. Uh, by the way, polymer chemistry at that point was almost not known. Just two years earlier, uh, science at large agreed that these are long molecules. I apologize for, for chemistry in it, and not an aggregate. So two years after we le learned what it is, we had somebody working fundamentals of it. And uh, that was not only uh, uh, an important commitment, but it was a stated commitment that the future of this company is going to depend on the fundamental research. Uh, the next thing which I think is very important is that that opened us to have links with the fundamental science around the world, with everybody else who is doing the science, allowed us to have contact with luminaries of science from outside of the pond. 
And I would never have otherwise pleasure working with, uh, <coughs> briefly, with Paul Flory, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, the next piece, which I think is, was very critical in that process of invention of the, all of these products, is the 1948 vision that the growth, future growth of this company is going to depend on uh, substitution of materials. That's a vision of 1948. By 1968, you will have all of the products that I listed uh, before came out about within 20 year period. Um, what uh, the goal was to substitute materials with flame resistance, with high strength, uh, high thermal properties, high elasticity. And, and some of these properties you will recognize as represented in materials like Kevlar for high strength, Nomex for high thermal resistance, or uh, sp spandex fiber. So uh, that broad vision uh, was critical. The adequate resources were equally critical. We have committed uh, ourselves to research and development for a long time. So obviously, we did not do that ourselves alone. That led us to contacts with academia, the contacts with uh, 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 governmental agencies, for example, NASA, and obviously commercial customers, because I want to come back that none of these materials, I, I know it's shocking, but none of these materials was developed for space programs specifically. It's the other way Joe could use these materials to design the suits for, for, the, for the purpose. Hundreds of companies were involved in space programs, and we worked and learned from every single one of them. So that, that is a comp these are, in my view, a components which uh, are behind that unusual list, which I think I will be the fifth one to say the 20 layers out of 21. Promise not to say it again. Uh, this, what is critical also, and I hope that Joe will address some of these issues, that these new materials require a completely different way of using materials. When uh, the properties are directional, depend on how, how you use the materials is at times as important as the property of the material itself. So uh, I would say uh, that uh, the reason is because we work with others. Uh, we did some work, hard work too, but we basically work with others, and I think we, we are committed to do it more, and my younger colleagues tell me that there are still great surprises ahead of us. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. No, I'll sing. <laughs> Can you hear me? Well, it's a real honor to be invited here tonight and sit on the uh, here with these uh, excellent uh, experts here. I've worked with most of them. Um, I just met Vladik uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago, on the phone. Uh, but we exchanged uh, ideas and information, and it's a, a pleasure to see him here and uh, discussing materials. Well, he's kind of led into uh, the, the topic of, of suit construction, but I, I'm going to kind of step back a little bit. Uh, reflect on the past and uh, the materials that were selected for spacesuits as, as Vlodek said uh, were really not developed specific, specifically for space application uh, but we certainly made use of all the properties that these materials gave us to accomplish the goals that we needed to accomplish uh, but let's uh, let me have the next slide please well when I was growing up uh, spacesuits were basically science fiction of course, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and probably a little older than some of you folks out here. So science fiction wasn't so much science fiction to you <laughs> as it was to me then. Science, is, uh, science fiction is more science reality nowadays. Uh, let me have the next slide. But as um, Kathy said, uh, the thing that really sparked us into the development of spacesuits was President Kennedy giving us the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. That was basically our high-level requirements that we had to work from. May I have the next slide? So first off, take a look at why we need a spacesuit. Uh, basically, there's three primary reasons. Uh, first, it, it provides the pressurized environment to give you the capability to be physiological uh, well-being in an environment that's pretty darn harsh. 
if uh, you didn't have a spacesuit and you went into the vacuum of space, I think you'd probably last about 15 minutes before you lost consciousness, and then you would, your blood would boil and you'd be in bad shape. So basically, the spacesuit provides you this pressurized environment for that physiological uh, well-being. Now, that's uh, not only the suit, but uh, the life support system, which does provide the, uh, the oxygen, uh, does that uh, first job. And removing metabolic heat was one important thing that we learned in the Gemini program, and that's when we went uh, and introduced the uh, liquid coolant garment. Again, materials from, from that uh, system were developed by uh, DuPont that we utilized. The second aspect of the spacesuit is the fact that uh, it allows you to have mobility capability. So the, the suit itself becomes the architectural entity to incorporate your mobility joint systems. Uh, this allows you to traverse in the free space or ambulate on the lunar surface and then someday hopefully more, we're going to ambulate on Mars. And thirdly, uh, it provides the uh, protection from the hazards of the uh, EVA environment, which is the thermal extremes, micrometeor oil debris, and our various uh, radiation conditions. Also, in the planetary surface applications from the uh, abrasion of uh, rocks and prevent dust getting inside the, uh, the suit and causing physiological problems there. So basically, the spacesuit becomes, in essence, the, uh, a small spacecraft in itself. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, if we look in the past, and, and the folks over here at the Smithsonian have really done an excellent job putting all this information together from a, a historic perspective. The Mercury program actually started off, uh, we utilized a, a, a Navy Mark IV suit. It was a high altitude pressure suit that basically gave us the capability of uh, uh, get down in case we did lose cabin pressure. Fortunately, in the Mercury program, we never used the suit pressurized, but it did provide us that uh, that secondary backup in case we did either lose cabin pressure or contaminated the cabin environment. Likewise, the Gemini suit uh, was a derivative of an Air Force uh, AP-22 high altitude suit. And um, after the uh, Russians did their EVA, I believe it was in May of 65, we spent three, four hard months working on the development of an extravehicular capability for the Gemini suit. In fact, it was a fairly secret program within our agency getting this thing ready, and our, our division was primarily responsible for the development of the capability for the EVA aspects of the Gemini suit. And we're very proud when Ed White went out and did his, I think it was around 25-minute EVA walk, but we showed that we had the same capability and technology that would match with the Russians. The Apollo program basically utilized two different suit configurations, A7L and A7LB, and they're differentiated by the methods of entry. A7LB suit had a zipper that went up the back side and the A7L uh, had basically a, a zipper that crossed over in a Z fashion, or just reverse, I'm sorry, A7L had the zipper up the back side, and the A7LB had the, uh, uh, the Z-shaped zipper arrangement. Now, one of the things that uh, really drove the selection of materials was the requirements for the application of the suit and in the environment we were going to use it in. So we had to uh, design the suit to accommodate both intravehicular operations and extravehicular operations. And it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, from an intravehicular standpoint and having a suit for a kind of a backup to a loss of cabin pressure, you want to maintain as much comfort as possible because 99% of the time this suit is not pressurized. So basically you don't want to encumber it with a lot of bulky mechanisms or a lot of bulky uh, spacesuit joints from a mobility standpoint, since ideally you never have to use this uh, system pressurized. But on the other hand, once you got on the lunar surface, you had to have this suit capable of uh, maintaining an environment for the astronaut to be able to uh, translate onto the lunar surface and, and do uh, exploratory work. So this meant that that suit 99% uh, of the time is going to be pressurized and you try to emphasize more of the uh, mobility features, uh, try to incorporate as much comfort as possible, but by the same token, emphasizing the mobility aspects of the suit. 
Uh, that was a real challenge, uh, and there was trade-offs in there. Obviously, you know, you couldn't go one way or the other full bore. You had to make selections, and a lot of that was driven by the materials available, too, to, to make mobility joint systems. Uh, we did use a, a molded convolute for all the single-axis joints uh, in the suit, and the single-axis, I mean the knee and elbow, and basically even the shoulder, uh, but we incorporated a kind of a mechanical system there, a sliding cable that helped uh, do the rotation of a shoulder joint that didn't have a bearing. But uh, it was a real lesson learned uh, from the standpoint of, of having to not provide the maximum capability in either sense. Uh, so that we took this lesson learned into the shuttle program uh, may I have the next slide, please? The shuttle program was really the first time we had an opportunity to design a full, fully functional extravehicular activity suit. In other words, this suit was only going to be used outside. We weren't going to use it in the vehicle. We do have another suit that is being used in the vehicle, and that's a derivative of, the, uh, of an Air Force uh, 1035 high-altitude suit. But they strictly are, are two suits as opposed to trying to combine that uh, combination of requirements into a one suit ensemble. And uh, we've been working that suit now successfully over the past 30 years. Um, we thought we were going to retire the suit, but now it's going to be supporting Space Station. And uh, seemingly it's doing a, its job well. When we first started the design of that suit, we thought we we figured we'd probably run out of the uh, the life of that suit after about 10 years and we'd be in, involved in the development of some more advanced suits, which never really came about. Uh, in the development of the advanced suits, and we can talk about this all night long, uh, but we ran into a real funding problem at the, uh, at the onset of the uh, space station program. We actually had some suits under development that were looking at higher operating pressure so we could eliminate uh, uh, pre-breathing operation, which is a, an overhead operation where you have to uh, eliminate uh, the nitrogen bubbles from the bloodstream, and it takes the astronaut a number of hours to do the pre-breathing. And so the idea was basically to uh, try to go from a sea level environment. At that time, of course, we were talking about having the station at a sea level environment and then going uh, directly to extravehicular environment, which is hard space. And so we developed a suit that operated at 8.3 PSI, twice the operating pressure of the shuttle suit. And of course, that was a real challenge. And there was another selection of materials, too, Velodic, uh, that we had to go through for this higher operating pressure suit. But uh, as it turned out, unfortunately, the funding didn't show up for the uh, space station program. And Joe can attest to this, too. He was <laughs> involved in this. Uh, so we never did uh, further the development of the, uh, the higher operating pressure suit. However, that suit became a, a good fundamental uh, workhorse uh, from our standpoint of looking at advanced mobility systems for future planetary surface exploration should we get back on that track again so we can uh, develop more materials in that regard and emphasize some more activities in, in developing capabilities for uh, pressurized operations at, at this regime. So currently, uh, the International Space Station is relying on the, uh, the shuttle suit as well as the uh, Russian Orlan M suit. And I don't know whether the, the museum has got a uh, Orlan suit on display, but... Do you have one for us. <laughs> <laughs> we have one, but we're using it. <laughs> but it'll, it'll eventually end up here, I'm sure. Uh, so that's about where we are now. Can I have the next slide? So the future. What I'd like to think is we're going to go back to the moon and then on to Mars with some sort of a renewed spirit of exploration. Right now, I, I think our, our goals are kind of a little mixed bag here. We've got this flexible path, and we don't have a real focus goal. And I think, you know, for young people, and to get the job done, you need to have a focus goal. You know, it, it, it's too random on saying, well, we're going to go here, there, or yonder. Uh, we need to really have an idea in mind of where we're going to head. In lieu of that, what we're going to end up doing now is working on the technology roadmap, trying to get us in a direction that we can maybe spin off with different elements uh, and satisfy some of the mission requirements. You know, there's talk about Lagrangian activities and maybe going to the moons of Mars and visiting a near-Earth asteroid. So all that will probably take place, but to do that with humans, you're going to need a spacesuit. 
uh, one form or fashion. And uh, obviously the technology is going to be developing along the lines of whatever the requirements for that particular mission will be. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So here's a kind of a, a shopping list that I put together, what I call the cardinal elements of a planetary spacesuit. Uh, I don't think I'm going to read through all of them, but the, the key elements are the mobility, robustness, you need to have lightweight systems, and it has to be simple enough for the, uh, the user to be able to, to work on and repair and maintain. Uh, you know, nowadays, you know, we bring the spacesuits home and we've got a group of suit technicians that maintain the suits, put them in back in their flight configuration and send them off again. When you go to the moon and you're going to spend 180 days there, you go to Mars and you're going to be there for three years or gone for three years, you're going to be able, you're going to have to be able to take care of your own equipment. So a lot of it is going to have to be a very simplistic approach to some of the, uh, the mobility systems and operational systems that we've incorporated into the spacesuit here. Uh, let me have the next slide. I guess that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we could probably discuss a lot of, of technical details, and, and, and what impressed me about uh, Mandy's effort here, I'm, I'll call her Mandy because I know Mandy for a while. Uh, you know, for, uh, for most people, you n people don't understand what's behind the spacesuit. When I say behind the spacesuit, all you probably see is this white envelope, and you wonder, well, is that the spacesuit? Well, obviously it's not the spacesuit, and you kind of got a little peek at it, from the x-ray uh, photography that was uh, shown in the, in the book. And it's pretty fascinating. I, I could probably talk to a lot of detail on that suit about what those elements are and, and why we don't do that the way we did it, because we learned lessons as, as we went along, too. Uh, but it'll, it'll, that's a little teaser, so you can maybe read the book and get a little more information. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be, am, am I on? Yes. Can you hear? Okay, I'm glad to be here too. The reason I'm here, by the way, uh, is that the Smithsonian asked Jack Schmidt, my fellow scientist astronaut who walked on the moon, uh, to come and he had a conflict, but he said, Kerwin knows a lot about suits too, so why don't you ask him? So they did. And since I was not fortunate enough to walk on the moon, although I did do one uh, rather uh, uh, ex uh, interesting space flight, uh, spacewalk in, in the A7L suit, uh, I called Al Bean. Uh, Al Bean was the lunar module pilot on Apollo 12. Uh, he landed on the moon with Pete Conrad, uh, whom I remember most for his statement as he was getting out of the limb. Uh, and uh, Pete was kind of a short guy. And he said, that may have been a, a small step for Neil, but it's a giant leap for me. <laughs> and. Uh, and I, and I asked Al, I said, Al, uh, uh, I'm going to the Smithsonian next week to talk about spacesuits, and you walked on the moon, so tell me what you remember about your suit experience. And he thought for a minute or two, and he said, okay, well, I remember that when Pete and I were loping out to the surveyor, which was an unmanned uh, uh, lunar lander that they landed a few hundred yards from, uh, uh, I, uh, we got out close to, to the surveyor, and I stopped, and I felt my ears pop. Uh, and when you're in a spacesuit and your ears pop, it's because you're losing pressure. And they were several hundred yards from the spacecraft. And he looked at Pete. Pete looked at him and said, what's the matter? Uh, well, my ears just popped. And uh, he looked at his, uh, his uh, suit gauge, and the suit pressure was within normal limits. And they kept looking at it for a minute or two, and it stayed the same. And they could not figure out until they got back, there is a little exhaust valve on the front of the suit that uh, uh, relieves overpressure. And the loping caused a slight increase in suit pressure because that valve got covered up by the, uh, the uh, uh, insulation material on the front of his suit. And when he stopped and uh, straightened up, his suit dropped back down to normal pressure and his ears popped. Uh, those little things mean a lot to you when you are 225,000 miles from home. Uh, Another thing, on the same, uh, same flight, uh, he and Pete are now uh, removing the lunar surface experiment pack from underneath the limb where it's stored, and they're walking it out to where they're going to deploy it. And Al noticed that the outside of his left leg was getting hot. And 
he th- suddenly remembered that that's where the radiate the radioactive material was. They they had what's called a, 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 a radiation thermal generator uh, to power to to give electrical power to this experiment suite for months or years after they left, and they had inserted the uh, the radiation core into it just just before transporting it, and he was feeling the heat from that core through the 21 layers of his suit. And he thought, thank goodness for those ladies in, uh, in Dover, Delaware that sewed this suit tight so it's uh, holding pressure, and he moved away a little bit. Uh, he remembers on the same jaunt out to the surveyor how uh, quickly exercise made you hot. Uh, the lunar surface was a very hot environment, uh, there was a wonderful liquid cooling system in the suit, which they kept on low to start out with because it was otherwise too effective. But as soon as they began to work hard in in terms of, uh, for instance, loping out, uh, uh, they began to sweat and feel hot. And he would reach up to his, uh, his control uh, panel and turn from low to medium. And he said it was like diving into a cold swimming pool. The cold just hit his but felt great, you know. It hit his body that quick and cooled him that well. He said, nobody I know ever went to high. Uh, and uh, the last thing that I'll relate from, uh, from Al Bean is, uh, is how uh, uh, when they were in the uh, lunar module before their first egress, uh, they did a suit check, uh, which involves pressurizing the suit above the lunar module pressure, shutting off the regulator, noting the pressure, and waiting one minute. And you 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 have a very small allowable pressure drop. Well, Pete's suit failed the uh, the leak test, and uh, so they looked things over. And uh, Al got in front of Pete, and he hit with the heel of his hand the suit gas connectors, and he felt one of them click, meaning it hadn't been completely seated. And uh, so that was a case of that leak check and the subsequent action saving uh, a, uh, a, a a really scary possibility of uh, having Pete uh, pop out a, a, a suit connector on the surface of the moon. Uh, I believe there was a check valve in that uh, system, but uh, it still would have been scary and, uh, and uh, a, a sort of temporary emergency. So that's, uh, that's to you straight from, uh, from, from Alan Bean on, uh, on uh, how important this suit is and basically how well it worked. For myself, I'll just say a few words. When I was a, a new young astronaut, they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, so they gave me the assignment of being the astronaut uh, suit t- technical representative. That means I had to follow the suit development around and uh, and uh, tell all things that were wrong. I had to ask crew members who uh, fitted suits or worked in them what the good and bad points were and uh, lean on the system until those things got, got fixed because the astronauts didn't know a lot about materials. Uh, they didn't know a lot about physiology except me. Uh, and... Uh, and what, what, what they were interested in was performance. They knew the job they had to do, and they wanted to make damn sure that suit would allow them to do the job. It had to have the mobility. Uh, it had to have the comfort. They had to be able to use the tools and so on and so forth. So I had to learn those requirements quick while I was in that uh, technical assignment. And I'll just tell you a couple of quick stories about things that happened. Pretty early on, I was being shown the uh, suit and the, uh, and the design of it, and they said, Here's the emergency oxygen system. And it was the thing about as big as my hand. It had a curved little oxygen tube in it, and it connected in. Uh, and uh, I said, boy, that's pretty small. Uh, does that meet? What requirement does that meet? They said it gives you a 30-minute emergency supply of oxygen. And I wasn't smart enough to ask the next question, but when I went back to my fellow astronauts, they were. And they said, uh, what if you get a hold of the suit? How long does it help you then? Or... What if the suit fan fails or you get a total electrical power and, this, and the, air, the, the gas in the suit stops moving and you have to go into blowdown mode? Well, it turned out it was about, the answer was about five minutes, which is not enough to get back to the lunar module. And uh, uh, so the, in the churning of those requirements, uh, the, we ended up with that large secondary oxygen pack, which is that big white thing that sits on top of the portable life support system. Uh, and that had a real 30-minute uh, emergency supply. By the way, did we ever use it? Uh, we, we never used it on the moon, but we uh, used the oxygen backup capability on, a, on, a, on Apollo 13 in order to make the calculations that, that got the crew home. So that was a question of realizing that a system uh, 
meets one requirement, but there are other requirements that it doesn't meet, and so you have to modify it. One more thing. There was a requirement. This suit, unlike the, uh, the uh, shuttle or, or space station suits, had to be both an extravehicular surface of the moon suit and an intravehicular launch entry protect me in case I lose pressure suit. Conflicting sets of requirements. Uh, and uh, I remember, again, as a young tech monitor, watching Wally Shiraz crew of Apollo 7. That was the first uh, Apollo flight to fly. It was after the fire and the, and the uh, redesign. It was during that, that period. His crew went into a, uh, a command module trainer, suited. They inflated the suits, and they went through the switch throwing and, uh, and, and activities of a reentry and landing. And Wally came shooting out of that cockpit like a mad fiend and insisted that that suit had to change because they weren't meeting requirements. The, his right elbow, when pressurized, had to sit on top of the left elbow of Don Isley, who was in the center couch. Uh, and Wally had to put his hand on the hand controller which, uh, what, with which he pointed the spacecraft. And he said, said, we've got interference, we've got shoulder interference, and we've got elbow interference, you've got to change it, and you've got to do it right now. And everybody is writing things down because Wally is one of the original seven astronauts. You know. So they changed it. But as soon as he flew, they changed it back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> except for the command module. The guy in the center seat got the narrower shoulders and the less mobile arms uh, because he was never going to go on the surface of the moon. But for the command module commander and the lunar module pilot, they changed it back because the primary requirement was to perform the activities on the lunar surface that you had to do. And the de de depressurized uh, reentry was a backup requirement that you could get around in a degraded fashion. And that's another way to use requirements, another lesson that I learned. I got a bunch more of those stories, and I hope to get questions and comments from you all when we're done, so I'll quit now. <laughs> Preservation. My goodness. Good evening. Um, I only met Joe and, and Vladik this evening, but I've known Joe for years, and I've been working with the products of what they did for many, many years. Um, I was given the, the spacesuit collection uh, many years ago by a, ver a very kind man called Greg Herkin. And then I was given the freedom to run with it by my supervisor of many, many years, Alan Nidell. And um, when, when I first got the, the collection, I barely knew whether you spelt spacesuit as one word or two. It was one of those, oh God. But what I did was I just sort of fi um, fixed on one word and, and that was it. But not, not knowing a great deal about spacesuits at the time, I made a conscious decision that somebody needed to care for these objects themselves. Um, and, and in a funny sort of way, they, they got a life of their own. And Jack Schmidt's suit, for example, was always known as Jack's suit. And then there was Neil, and then there was Buzz, and everybody's suit had, had a name. And it took me about 10 years to put the suits back together. Um, over the years, they'd, they'd become separated from their various components, and um, it, it, I had to get all the components back and match the suits up by serial number and that sort of thing. Anyway, around 1999, um, I applied for a grant, and Alan took it forward, and we got the Save America's Treasures grant. Unfortunately, uh, we asked for a great deal of money, and with Save America's Treasures. I don't know if any of you have ever applied for one of these grants, but when you asked for a Save America's Treasures grant, you had to come up with the matching funds. And writing the grant for the Save America's Treasures portion was the easy part. But Hamilton Sunstrand, who had done so much work with spacesuits and life support systems over the years, oh God, thank goodness for them. They gave us the entire money. And we were able to embark on um, something that I don't know that we ever could have done otherwise. We were able to look inside the spacesuits and work out why they were, I hesitate to say they were dying, but they were falling apart. They were made out of materials, love you though I do, beautiful <laughs> materials, but 
they didn't react well to one another always. And they were modern materials, and the lifespan of those materials in this given circumstance had never been studied. There was no reason to study them. But a spacesuit is made of all these materials, these nylons, polyesters, you name it, uh, along with metals and glues and coupled with sweat and being dunked in the um, neutral buoyancy tanks, which are very high in chlorine. The end result was that these spacesuits were falling apart before, before our eyes. So we had a, a spacesuit conservator, who's here in the audience this evening, Lisa Young, and she started doing the research on what happens to rubber when it's been dumped, dunked in, in, in chlorine and what, what happens when you mix them all these materials together and they start off gassing and is cold temperature the right way to do it or warm temperature do, do we need to be dry do we need to be cold and that's what that's what I did for the next what 10 years after that oh god my life is just passing me by but <laughs> when I when I was almost all the way through this um, I decided it was time to write this down because Mandy has retired, and I wanted to leave some information behind. And Mark Avino, already introduced, said, well, no, no, let's photograph these. And um, this was a fairly major photogra uh, pho excuse me, photographic project. And we were not exactly tagging it on to the Save America's Treasures project, but it was, uh, it was definitely a part of it. And Hamilton said we could do it, and Save America's Treasures said we could do it, and um, the photography unit said we could do it. And so Mark started to photograph the, the spacesuits. As they came back from loan, we were able to look at them, clean them, do, do our thing with them, and he photographed them. And that's where all the photographs came came from. And so when we stuck it all into a, into a book, that's what happened. Anyway, I'm going to be quiet because Kathy has questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you all. I, there's, there's so many questions, but I, I don't want us to run too terribly late out of time. So if there are any questions from the audience, if you could please stand or raise. Yes, right there. If you can speak loudly, I can hear so I can hear, and I'll, then I can repeat it back to the rest of the audience because the acoustics are such that they can, I can hear you, but the rest of the audience can't hear you. Nobody talked about cost of development of these suits, so could somebody speak to that, please? Um, the question was, no one talk about, talked about the cost of the development of the suits, and could somebody answer that question? I guess um, uh, Joe in, Cosmo in regard to Specifically, what the, the development of materials? No, development of materials, no, or materials were already developed. It's the part that you added by putting everything together. Oh, well, the cost you know, of putting everything together. For example, so. I and I'm just going to give. Well, the funny bit you didn't get for the suit that you want. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go back in history. Uh, the the uh, the the Mercury and Gemini suits probably cost us roughly about thirty thousand dollars per copy. And back in that day, we had each one of those uh, astronauts had three suits. They had a training suit, a backup, and a, uh, and a flight suit. Uh, and they were pretty much customized. Uh, when we got into the shuttle program, well, let me go to Apollo. Apollo, it got more expensive. Those suits were on the order of probably about $160,000. And I think the total inventory that I remember off the top of my head is over the period of years that we had the Apollo program with the number of astronauts, I think we built a total of about 160 suits. 100, I believe that Bill Airy told me 165. But okay, <laughs> I'm sure five. <laughs> we're, we're hiding we're, five we're, suits. We're still I'm, I'm from <laughs> 40 years of memory. I, yeah. <laughs> But, but the anyway, suits got more expensive as yeah, the time went they on. They got more expensive thing. because it got more complex too. As I maybe I didn't allude enough to the fact that you know the the earlier suits, the the high altitude pressure suits were very simplistic. It was mostly a gas bag that had very simple mobility to get me down. And if you're a fighter pilot, you either had the throttle to stick or your ejection seat to get you out of it. 
And so you didn't need a, a high a degree of sophisticated mobility. Now, obviously, in Apollo, as Joe mentioned, also, uh, the fact is that we had requirements for intravehicular and extravehicular activities, so we had to develop more sophisticated mobility joint systems, plus we had to incorporate a lot more materials, so the cost obviously went up. And, and I'm thinking there was on the order of about $160,000 per suit. Of seventies dollars, yeah. This you got to think this in terms of, of that particular fiscal period of time. Now, when we got to the shuttle program, and this is just a rough number, the, the backpack is f probably cost four times more than the suit. The suit costs a million dollars, and so the backpacks cost anywhere from maybe eight to ten million dollars. So you're, we're talking about, uh, you know, probably about a, a twelve million dollar ensemble. But let me point this out. There are no shuttle suits. The shuttle suit is built of modular elements. Uh, so essentially we had to accommodate in the shuttle program the first time we got females uh, and, and we also got away from customizing suits because we couldn't afford to customize suits. We couldn't afford to build individual suits, uh, put them on the rack for these astronauts because if you look at the number of astronauts, we probably had 300 over the past 30 years, I guess. We have modular elements that you can make combinations. So with these modular elements, you could probably make combinations of thousands of configurations of suits. But they're still relatively expensive. They're, you know, 10 to 12,000, uh, 10 to 12 million dollars per ensemble. Uh, in the inventory, I think we only have like 15 backpacks so when you have 15 life support systems that have been flying over these past 30 some years uh, and a lot of parts and pieces of the soft goods elements that make up, up the suit. Uh, the funding that we were talking about for space station in regard to the advanced suit, we had what we called the great swim off at one time. There was a two suit configurations being evaluated. There was the uh, AX-5 which is being built at uh, NASA Ames, and we were developing the uh, the Mark III suit at JSC, uh, and this was kind of played up in the media and all, uh, looking at the performance capabilities between these suits, and we went through basically, I guess, two years of really hard effort down selecting of trying to figure out which one of these suits or what combinations of these two suits would be best for the future for space station. But there was a, a controversy, too, in regard to the number of EVAs that we were going to do on space station. There were there's two camps. One camp said that we probably weren't going to do more than 300 hours of EVA per year. And the other camp, I think it was the, uh, uh, the Fisher Price study, said you're going to be doing over 1,500 hours of EVA. Well, as it turned out, uh, the camp that said we weren't going to do many EVAs won out, and so we didn't develop that advanced suit for, for, space, for space station. But we took the technology from a lot of the advanced suit work that we were doing, both with the AX-5 and the Mark III, and, and incorporated it into upgrades for the shuttle suit. And the shuttle suit's done fine uh, over these past 30 years. Um, so I think that's kind of a long dissertation on cost, but I, I hope you get the picture of, of how things kind of formulate in, in the way of developing uh, these expenditures as time goes on. Dr. Gabar, you had an I answer about cost. Add one, one word, uh, and that's partially why I was stressing that none of these materials were developed for space program. The cost, the cost would have most probably quadruple or uh, increased by a factor of 10 if the materials would have to be developed and produced for the, the small application. It's good to have nylon stockings as a reason to introduce nylon. Yeah, it reduces the cost significantly. <laughs> and there's another aspect, too. There are certain uh, elements that we had to develop, certain materials. For example, on the shuttle, uh, we needed a higher uh, abrasion and uh, tear-resistant material. Uh, it's called orthofabric. But we went through 11 variations of different combinations of materials and weaves to down-select that. And that was you know, a fairly expensive uh, effort just to develop that one layer. And we try not to have to develop, as, as Lodic said, uh, a, a lot of materials. What we look around for is a, 
off the shelf, you know, more or less what's available in, the, in today's technology, because it does get very cost prohibitive to try to de develop something special. But sometimes you have to go and, and develop that special item if you can't find anything that solves the problem of the requirements that you've uh, levied on it. The gentleman in the green shirt. Um, Mrs. Young spoke about her work gathering the components of, of the different um, seats together. I was wondering if you have an example of a piece being gathered together and then the unusual place, or are there examples of pieces still missing? Um, do you tell the story of how you gather the components for the spacesuits, and do you have an example of a piece, a component being found in an unusual place, or are there any pieces that are remain missing? Okay. Remember, the registrar is sitting over there. The registrar so. is over there. So. <laughs> Way back in the dark ages, when all these suits first came to NASA, the requests, the number of, of requests to borrow spacesuits was absolutely overwhelming. And it was a, uh, not an, an entire suit didn't necessarily arrive at the same time. By entire, I mean the suit, the helmet, the gloves, the boots, all of that didn't necessarily arrive at exactly the same time. And because the, um, there were these requests to put them on display because the space program was really in its, in its sort of heyday, um, a lot of suits were sent out on loan with mismatched gloves. In other words, um, one suit went there with, with somebody else's gloves and somebody else's helmet. And when I said that it took me 10 years to get them back, it, I, as the pieces came back from loan, I was able to put a hold and not send that particular component out again on loan until I had the whole suit back together. And then it could be treated, put on a, on a conservationally correct mannequin bef and uh, go out again on loan if it was able. Um, uh, an example of um, uh, an object that was found in, in an odd place, it's not really an odd place, but it was an odd place. Um, when, with the Apollo 11, suit, helmet, boots, and, and gloves. The boots were left on the moon, and so we had uh, all three spacesuits and their pressure bubbles. Um, we had uh, two pairs of gloves, and we were good to go, except we didn't have the gold-visored helmets that came off. And I was told that the gold-visored helmets had been left on the moon, and all the research I was able to do, I couldn't find them. Uh, I, so I just assumed. And then Buzz's helmet came back from a, lo a loan, and I believe it was in Switzerland. And I knew that if Buzz's helmet had come back, I knew Niels was around somewhere. And so I started the search. I went through everything. I double-checked everybody who had a helmet on loan. I asked them to send me the serial number. All of it couldn't find it anywhere. And one day I just gave up and I was opening a case downstairs that we had here that was, um, you know, it, it had the, the full Apollo getup. And I was told that wasn't a helmet, it was just a, 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 an ordinary helmet, a training helmet or something like that. And I took it off and I saw this aerial number and you want to talk about Eureka, we've, we've got touchdown. <laughs> um, that, and that was when Neil's helmet showed up. It never went anywhere else that it shouldn't have. <laughs> um, yes, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Could you discuss I, the helmets? Who made them, how they were developed, the materials that were used, well, and how did you assure that they didn't crack on? The Mercury and Gemini helmets uh, early uh, were plexiglass. Were plexiglass. You know, the Mercury and Gemini helmets were plexiglass, and we dropped a, a Gemini helmet one time and cracked the plexiglass. And that's how we found out that these things are vulnerable to uh, being destructed fairly easily. Uh, so we, uh, GE, General, uh, General Electric, uh, has the... Um, uh, UV stabilized Lexan material. Uh, the folks that uh, 
actually formed and developed the helmet, uh, we did it in-house. The, the actual configuration of the Apollo helmet was developed in-house by two uh, engineers, uh, Jim O'Kane and Dr. Uh, uh, Bob Jones. Uh, but the, the manufacture of the helmet was be, is done by uh, Airlock Corporation. And uh, they've been building the helmets. Excuse me, are you talking about the pressure bubble or that gold visored helmet that the Apollo astronauts wore on the lunar surface? I'm talking about wearing something and if someone tripped in a rock. That's the pressure. Yeah. yeah. What, what were the safety measures taken on, on the actual bubble helmet? The Apollo astronauts wore two, bubble, wore two helmets on the moon. They didn't, um, the gold visored helmet was not a pressure helmet at all. It was an over helmet that they wore over the pressure bubble. The pressure bubble is what Joe was talking about and the gold visored over helmet was, was actually manufactured by Ling, Ling Temco Voigt, LTV. Well, they did the coating. They did, yeah. yeah. And then, the, and it, then it had two visors. Right, it had a polysulfone visor. Which that is was the gold one. The gold coated. And it had a, another protective visor. Underneath, which underneath. was UV stabilized. And you can see through both of them? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Seriously cool, too. Yeah. We have time just for <laughs> one like last, of, of last question. I, I the gentleman standing up in the back in the blue shirt, if you... Was there ever a problem with bugs getting into the suit? <laughs> you mean on the lunar surface? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be unusual. <laughs> no, it's most of the new uh. storage of <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any bugs. One of my horror stories is of a spacesuit coming back from loan with bugs in it, yes. <laughs> but after, not, not from the moon, but after it's been moon. on loan and on exhibit. <laughs> Somebody left a cookie in it. I mean, you, you, you don't believe me. I've got horror stories. Some of you saw the biological isolation garment hanging in the museum, uh, which was worn by the first couple of of Apollo crews to return from the moon. Uh, it was a soft garment that zipped up over the helmet and it had a uh, filter uh, so that your exhaled breath, if it contained any virulent uh, 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 bacteria or viruses picked up on the moon, would, uh, would not uh, cor uh, corrupt the earth and, and kill us all. Uh, some of us thought that was pretty dumb since the moon has a, a temperature of, you know, plus or minus 300 degrees. It's in a vacuum and has been subjected to hard radiation for four billion years. But <laughs> never mind. We couldn't prove that it wasn't going to happen, so we had to do it. And as the suit tester, uh, somebody handed me one of those uh, bigs, as, as, as we call it, and said, check this out, will you, to, to see if it works all right. So I brought it home. Uh, I had a little swimming pool in the backyard, and I put that thing on and zipped up the zipper, and I jumped into the water, uh, and I got the exhalation valve wet, and I couldn't breathe. And I almost drowned. I mean, I frantically finally got that zipper unzipped and the thing off my head. Uh, and I called Neil Armstrong and said, this isn't going to work. we got to do something better. Uh, and they did, they modified it to, uh, uh, to, uh, to change a couple things so that even if the uh, exhalation valve was wet, uh, you could live in it. But it was an encumbrance, it was somewhat dangerous. Uh, we lived with it for uh, two missions and then uh, canned it when we found that the moon was safe after all. Thank you. I, I really would like to um, ask you to join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, I know this has been wonderful. This has been far too short, and I know you have many, many more questions to ask, and we will hope to find many of the answers, some of the unanswerable questions. Uh, but I want to thank you for, um, for attending this evening. Uh, just as a point of administration, um, I ask, we ask that you exit through the upper doors of the, museum, of the theater and then go down the escalators to the first floor level. Um, there will be an opportunity to purchase the Spacesuits book and have the authors and our panelists sign autographs this evening. 
And I also want to thank Keith, the man behind the screen in the back, who's the one who met the, made this program work and so smoothly this evening. But thank you all. Thank you, Sites and DuPont, for having this opportunity. And I hope you all took something away, learned something this evening. Good night. <laughs>